Um, as we all know, this is a parable. Jesus spoke in parables, stories, simple ways for people to understand. Super familiar to all of us, right? It's the parable of the talents. It's very simple. He talks of this master who goes for a long trip, gives five talents to one person, three talents to another person, and one to another. And then comes back after a while, the guy who had five doubled, the guy who had three doubled it, the guy who had one did nothing and just buried it. That's it. And I, I know we all know this, and as we are starting today, if we can have the first slide, the topic I was thinking is we heard about missions and what's going on out in the world, but how can we live a missional life? How can we embrace God's mission for our lives to see where is God calling you and me? How can we live a life that matters? How can we live a life that has an impact? So what I want to unpack today are some very simple, practical application tips. I'm not going to go into a detailed exegesis like we do every week, uh, but I want to really draw some principles that we can walk away with and immediately be able to apply to our lives. So in short, what I want to look at is what does the parable of talents mean for us as individuals, as families, and as a church in the Bay Area? You know, some of us uh, are at the crossroads of starting something new. You know, some of you are probably finishing high school and entering college, and you're excited about that. And some of us, uh, some of you have finished college and you're starting work. And some have just moved here to the Bay Area with a dream. And some of us have worked for a long time and, are at, and we have crossed our midlife. Uh, how can we make our lives count? How can we make our lives matter? And how does the parable of the talents give us insights towards this? You know, Jesus is talking about this. It's, it's a middle parable sandwiched between two. You know, before this, he gives the parable of the ten virgins. And after this, he's going to talk about sheep and goats. And what he is telling us, how can you live a, a radically different life as Christians, as you're awaiting Jesus' return. You know, Jesus is giving this before he's going to go and die. And he's telling them, yes, I'm going to be gone, but between the time I'm gone and I come back, I want you guys to live a different life. Because I've come here to create a kingdom, a new kind of a kingdom, a kingdom that is not like the kingdoms of the world where it's about power and love and money. This is a kingdom about serving one another. In this kingdom, you are going to be peacemakers. In this kingdom, you are going to be pure in heart. In this kingdom, you are going to be persecuted for doing what's right. And so, I want you to be prepared and live a life. And he talks about the ten virgins, and now he's talking about I'm not going to just leave you like this and expect you to do it. I'm actually, I'm going to bless each of you with several things. You know, what is a talent is a question I want to first clarify. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point. We probably don't use this terminology much in the recent years. But if you can go to the next slide. A parable, a talent is actually a measure. You know, it's a measure of um, either some amount of gold or copper or silver. And in those days, it's like dollars and cents, you know? So one, one um, talent was equal to a thousand dinar, right? If you click it again, it means it's 20 years of wages. And, and people did some calculation, there's some economists to see how much would one talent roughly translate, you know, take into account inflation and all of that. Um, that is like a, th like a million dollars approximately, you know, 800K to a million dollars. So what's really fascinating is Jesus didn't say, I want you guys to live this awesome life and didn't leave them without anything. He says, I've, I've actually blessed you guys with lots of stuff so you can actually live a life that makes a difference. But what is a talent in our times? Is it just talking about money? No. I think what God is referring to is Jesus saying, look at all the things I have given you. And, you know, I try to plot a pie chart of that in the next slide, um, if you look at that. 
If you look at it as a coin, there are all these different facets that God has blessed us with. He's given us a body, a mind, a spirit. He's given us time. He's given us work. He's given us money. He's given us a family, and He's given us a real talent, too. So He wants to see us use each one of these areas as a good steward to live a missional life. It's not in a vacuum. You know, so the first thing, the principle I want to talk about is we need to know our worth. Every single one of us, God has blessed us with something valuable in each of these areas. You know, live valuably. It says, you know, verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, then he went away. God has blessed you with something. Everyone. He wants, and why does God do that? He does that to show that we are valuable to him. He cares about us. He cares about you and me. You know, if you um, look at that quote from, um, you probably have known Nick Wujicic, right? Um, if you can pull up the next slide. He is um, someone who doesn't have hands or legs. If you're thinking of a, a, a healthy person, if there's someone who can really be upset or frustrated, it's him. He doesn't have hands or legs, but he, this is what he says, it is a lie to think you're not good enough. It is a lie to think you're not worth anything. He uses his life to inspire millions of people by helping them to embrace their value in Christ, their worth in Christ. You know, and for most of us, we do have hands and legs. We, we, we live pretty healthy lives, isn't it? So God has blessed us with that. We need to see that we are worthy. He cares about us. And secondly, the mind. I mean, that's one of the reasons we are here in the Bay Area. You know, there was a recent study of all the different ethnic groups in the United States. You know, the United States is a land of immigrants, right? Unless you're a Native American, every other person you meet came from another country. And they found currently um, Indians and Asians have the highest percentage of education, undergraduate and graduate degrees. It's way up like in the high 60s and 70s compared to some of the other ethnic groups that are less than 20%. Sometimes we don't, we are not conscious of these things and we don't see how God has blessed us. So we, we have pretty much good health. At least we all have our hands and feet. We may have a few minor health issues, but other than that, God has blessed us with good education. And, and spiritually, and this is the part, you know what Jesus said when he left us? He's blessed everyone with at least one spiritual gift. So we have a spiritual gift. Whether you believe it or not, it's not just me up here as a pastor or the other elders and David and others who have these great gifts. Every single one of you have a spiritual gift. So we have a great body, we have a mind, we have a spirit. And he's blessed us with time. Several of us are young and, and you know, we are in the prime of our life and our careers. And, you know, I, I, I was just seeing they're planning a reunion from my high school and already seven of my friends have died. But God has given us life. If you're up every morning and you're able to breathe and live, that's a blessing. And next is work. We are living in the land of opportunity. There's a wealth of jobs. You know, the, the, the GDP of the United States is like, what, $15 trillion or something? It's big, uh, the GDP of California alone is larger than that of several European nations, like France and other places. So here is another talent or a blessing that God has blessed us with. And look at money. Here again, I was referring to that survey earlier where they said Indians and Asians are the highest earning people group in the Bay Area. The average income of an Indian household is $101,000. Can you believe that? And family, you know, I think if you are a part of a church and if you're a God-loving, family, 
We have one of the most stable families in this country, where contrary to what people say, divorce rates are not that high. 50% of marriages outside of the church end up in a divorce. Whereas among evangelical Christian God-fearing homes, across the entire United States, 80% to 85% of marriages are doing great. And lastly, all of us have a talent. You know, some of us are good at sports, some of us are good at art, some of us are good at music. Now, why do I say all this? Is God is expecting us to use all these things together, collectively, not for ourselves, but to live a missional life with an impact. The question to ask is, are we doing that? But what do we actually do most of the time, honestly, if you think about it? Most of us spend most of our time thinking about what we don't have and complain. Isn't it? We don't see all the blessings we already have. We just like take it for granted, but there's just this one thing we don't have and we complain. We don't re and, and we don't see our value. Now that's why this old song, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you to see what the Lord has done. So live, live valuably to see, wow, really first I need to see what are the talents, I mean the different ways in which God has blessed me in all these areas, and especially this being thanksgiving, it leads us to our second point, it needs to enable us to live thankfully by knowing our ability. It says, you know, in that verse, each one according to his ability is how God has given us. You know, that sometimes these very things, if we don't put them together and use it to live impactfully, to live missionally, they can become an idol in our own lives. You can just take one of these and get set on it, whether it's health or money or our family. Any of these can become our idols. And then we will constantly end up comparing ourselves with one another. That's the worst thing to do in life, you know. And um, everybody cannot do everything. And God is building his kingdom and wants us to find what he wants us to do so we can live for it. So it is about following God's dream for our lives based on what he has given us and not others. How many of you know jo Tony, Tony Erickson Tada? Johnny Erickson Tada. Sorry, it's not Tony. It's a typo. She um, was, a, as a teenager, um, she became paralyzed from her neck down. And she thought, that's the end of her life. But then, after going through a lot of painful moments and coming to connect with God, her whole life changed. You know, she was a very active athlete, ski jumping and doing all these things. From 18 year old, imagine you are paralyzed. But she made her life count, and this is what he said. She said, my wheelchair was the key to seeing all this happen, especially since God's power always shows up best in weakness. So here I sit, glad that I have not been healed on the outside, but glad that I have been healed on the inside, healed from my very own self-centered wants and wishes. If Johnny Erickson Tata can say that, I think we have much, much more to be thankful for, to know our abilities. And you know, lastly, comes the point where Jesus comes back. I mean, he says the master comes back and talks to the people. And we read, he who had the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more. So also he who had the two talents made two more. You know, the phrase to look here is, it says, went at once. Know your impact. You know, live impactfully. You know, God desires that we use each one of these areas collectively to make an impact. And I think it's 
in this Thanksgiving week, as we unwind with our friends and family, as we spend time ourselves thinking about what am I thankful for, let's take stock of all these areas. Say, how am I doing in all these areas in my life? You know? Um, here's where uh, I, had, I like this quote by Steve Jobs. Um, said, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice, and most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. You know, we know Steve Jobs made such an impact, it's such a young life, and though he really didn't know God, I think God used him in some amazing ways. But we have a bigger God. And we have a bigger vision and a bigger mission in this world. And we have Christ who is here to empower us to do these things. So how can we live impactfully? And how can we be, start with being good stewards of our bodies? How can we use our God-given wealth generously by giving it to purposes that matter? How do we spend our time? We all have just 24 hours in a day. Those who do great things to those who don't do great things. How do we use our time? You know, apart from the time that you have to do for work and stuff, do we use it just for our self-pleasure or are we finding ways to use it to bless others? And how about our mind? You know, are we, are we learning something new? Um, you know, um, there is this... Uh, um, story of uh, uh, how many of you have seen Unbroken, the, the movie? You know, it's the story of this survivor who survived World War when his plane crashed in Japan and he ended up in the concentration camp and he was abused and mistreated and all of that uh, by Laura Hildenbrand. She wrote that. And then he moved to the United States. He went to a Billy Graham crusade, came to know Christ. His life radically changed. And then he went back and reconciled with the one in Japan. But I... Recently, a few years ago, um, got to see him when he came to speak here in the Bay Area. He was around in his late 90s. Until he was in his 80s, he was learning something new. He learned snowboarding when he was 82 years old. <laughs> Can you believe that? And we, we tend to give up things pretty soon in terms of what we want to do. So God expects us to see what is his vision for our lives, learn something new, and most importantly, work. I think work takes the most time for all of us, isn't it? Yet it is there we are unable to find God's purpose. It is there we are unable to find God's mission. But this is what Billy Graham said, and I've shared this repeatedly, that the greatest move of God in the 21st century is going to be through people in the marketplace. So what you do with your work in the marketplace has a significant impact. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, why am I working? Yes, I got a great job. I'm making a lot of money, which is all fantastic. But am I happy? Am I able to experience and make an impact in my life, in the life of those around us. And that is something that comes from knowing Christ and becoming a disciple of Christ and understanding his kingdom and seeking how you can do it. And that is one of the desires we have as our church. You know, as part of our vision, we want to start the center of faith and work where we can help people come together and brainstorm and, and go for startups making goods that are really good, that can have an impact in, in, in solving the problems in the world. I was reading an article um, by Pat Gelsinger, who's the CEO of VMware, and he was talking about, is technology helpful or harmful to solve the world's problems? We need to start thinking along those lines. We are all doing tech, right? We are creating technology. But have we ever asked ourselves the question, what is this technology that I am doing, doing in the world? What real global problems is this technology solving? 
So Pat Gelsinger, um, from a Silicon Valley perspective, he identified three areas how technology is going to be phenomenally useful. You know, he spoke about um, the cloud. He spoke about how it has increased capacity. He believes that's going to be tremendous. He spoke about artificial intelligence, how all this learning that we have is going to create new devices in medical areas and other areas. And thirdly, he spoke about Internet of Things, which is kind of connecting everything. So I'm sure every single one of you in this room is involved in either doing something related to that or consuming something that's coming out of that. Well, this may sound too big and grandiose. He's a CEO. He can talk like that, right? Because he's had the decision-making ability to drive a company to create those products. And his point was, as, as these technologies develop and as the tide rises, that will help alleviate all the world's problems too. Now, I'm not a CEO, so I can't comment on that. But for you and me, we need to ask ourselves a question. Hey, God has given me this gift, this education, this talent, this time. What is the end product of this beyond money? What is this actually doing? Is it creating a shift anywhere globally in anything? Is it reducing poverty? Is it enhancing a quality of people's lives in some places where they don't? We have that responsibility, and it's only when that gets locked in, you're going to enjoy your work. Money is secondary. It's going to come. But that's, that's a vision we have as a church. We want to create the center for faith and work. We want to bring in Christian entrepreneurs, Christian venture capitalists, Christian CEOs, possible Pat Gelsinger himself at some point to come and encourage us to, to really... Try this, you know, not feel super safe. Oh, I don't want to leave my safe comfort zone. I just want to read my Bible, come to church, you know, I'll, I'll do my thing and go. No, but I think God wants us to be radical disciples because work matters. Because God is deeply concerned about what you and me do with our hands and our minds and our feet. And let's pray that God will allow that to happen for us. And as a family, you know, think, of your, think about ourselves. How is my family doing? Have I grown in my love for my spouse, my children, my parents? And importantly, spiritual gifts. Am I using my spiritual gift? First of all, do I know my spiritual gift? We've done this discovery of spiritual gift several times, right? Where we all know we have this gift. But it's kind of like use it or lose it. That's what he says. You don't use your spiritual gift, you lose it. So if God has given a spiritual gift, if I'm just coming to church every week and leaving without using that gift, which is actually meant to bless someone, it's not for you, then there's a problem. We have a problem. We are, not, we are going to be among those guys who just buried it. And God is super mad about that. You know, he says, like, you can't do that. But he really wants us to use these. And, and there are three positive motivations. I'll close with that and three negative motivations to do that. When all these guys come back, the five and the three, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, the first, first positive motivation is appreciation. You know, appreciation is what our kids thrive under. You know, I even with Brian and Sophia, they, they'll come back. I'm sure all of your kids do running from the Spectrum kids, and they'll show you this beautiful piece of paper and has this amazing art. Most of the time it's scribbled. I can't even figure out what that thing is. But they are looking at me, and they want me to say, wow, awesome, it's cool. Don't your kids do that too? And you see their smile. They're like, wow, my daddy. And they're like, I drew this for you, dada. Isn't that fantastic to hear that from our children? And that's what God is expecting. He's, he says, I've given you all these things, guys. Here you go. Take all these talents. Do something awesome with that. Do something amazing with that. Do something impactful with that. And then come back. I'm going to say, great job. I think that's going to make our heart melt. Appreciation. Secondly, it's reward. He says, you have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. What that means is there's going to be more work. 
oh, you did this, you were good at the small stuff, let me expand your territory, let me give you more stuff, and, and guess what? This is not something just temporal, it's going to spill into eternity too. When you go into heaven, we are not just going to be wearing white robes and singing hallelujah all the time. In the new heaven and in the new earth, every single person is going to be at work, a work that is thriving, a work that's joyful, a work that doesn't have the elements of sin in it. And last thing is joy. It says, enter into the joy of your master. Real joy. You know when real joy comes? When we know that we are living our lives for a purpose bigger than ourselves. When we know that our lives are making an impact beyond our own lives for the sake of his kingdom. And then he looks at the guy who didn't do much. The guy who came back and pretty much said, Master, I know, knew you to be a hard man, repaying where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own interest. So the talent, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, the, the first issue with the problem with this guy is not what he did, it's what he didn't do. You know, there's a sins of commission and sins of omission. If you have all these great things God has blessed us with, and we don't use it for his purposes, that's a problem. And that's what he's talking of slothfulness. He just went and buried it, didn't touch it. And God says, that's not right. And secondly, the main reason he did that, he says, is he gives a view of God that is so wrong. He says, I knew you're someone who is so horrible, so terrible. You're, you're like this. And I think why we will not be able to live that kingdom life is because we have an improper view of God. How do I get the motivation to live a life like this? Who can live this missional life? Who can live this impactful life? It's only the ones who have seen the real Jesus. And you know what the negative consequence of living like this is? Is separation. Separation is a terrible thing. I mean, he says there's darkness. No one can see anyone, right? There's no one and nothing to see. And then there is nothing to do in contrast to the children who have work to do, eternally or unemployed. And thirdly, you're feeling forever the regrets of lost opportunities, misspent choices, and chances. You know, he says weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're like, man, I wish I did that. Man, I had this opportunity and I just wasted it on myself and my own self. But once those of us who have seen God and seen Jesus, who have seen what he did, to give us all these rich talents, he had to empty himself on the cross. He had to become poor so we could become rich. He had to be eternally separated from God his Father so we can always be united with him and live a life that matters for him. It's only those of us who have seen, oh, I am messed up inside. And I want someone to come inside and change me and come to this Jesus and experience that radical change like Joni Erickson, Joni Erickson Tada did and uh, Nick Wujicic did. We would be able to say, I want my life to matter for his sake. And it begins with a right view of God and a right view of Jesus. And that is what we are here to do at Spectrum Church week after week after week, is to proclaim who God is so that we can know him and experience him and use all these wonderful gifts that God has given us 
with a purpose to bless him. So shall we look at our areas in our lives and see, am I using these for God's purposes? Is my life being impactful? And use this week to give thanks to God for those areas and pray and ask God to show us how he can enable us to take that next step. Shall we pray? Thank you.